Welcome to our webinar, Monitoring Health of Seafarers with Digital Tools from our sponsors, Gnomon. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Fotis Gonidis, Digital Health Product Lead with Gnomon Informatics. If you have any question about the topics today, please type them in the Q&A section and we'll get them answered for you at the end of the presentation. Here is our host, Carl Jeffrey from Digital Ship to explain more. Hi, so we're going to talk today about ways to monitor the health of seafarers with digital tools. So we've all seen plenty of advances in digital tools to monitor our own health over the past few years. So that includes wearable devices and health tracking applications and tools to connect us with remote medical experts and tools to help detect health issues earlier and develop personalised wellness programmes. And there's no reason why all of this can't be available to seafarers, particularly now we're seeing big improvements in satellite communication speeds between ship and shore. And there can be commercial benefits to better health monitoring, particularly if it helps shipping companies feel more comfortable taking on seafarers with minor ongoing health problems, such as diabetes and high blood pressure. We can monitor their health while they're at sea. So we're gonna hear about how it can be done in shipping today from No One Informatics. They're based in Thessaloniki, Greece, and they specialize in digital health products. No one's background is more in the onshore sector than maritime. They've been providing health monitoring services to hospitals and clinics around Greece for 10 years and also health data management services. Much of that is supporting people with long term health, health issues such as diabetes and high blood pressure. They've also got tools to report incidents and get the right sort of medical advice. Our speaker is Dr. Fotis Vanidis, Digital Health Product Lead with No One. I should point out we're calling him doctor because he has a PhD in computer science. He's not a medical doctor. And that no one his work includes development of digital therapeutics, patient platforms, and chronic disease management solutions. So we'll have a talk of about 30 minutes, then we'll take your questions. You can put questions in the QA box at any time. And I'd like to invite Fotis to start his talk. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Carl, for the introduction. And um, welcome and thank you everyone for joining this uh, session today. Uh, I will share my screen now. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Perfect. So as uh, Carl uh, introduced the topic, uh, our talk today is about um, digital uh, tools and uh, ways so that um, we can uh, monitor and rather help uh, seafarers while they are on uh, the ship to better manage and uh, their health and their condition and um, have better healthcare services when and if needed. I will start with some uh, introduction and um, some uh, facts and recent trends and when it comes to the maritime health digitization. So I think we that we all agree that the maritime industry is one of the main drivers of the uh, global economy and that it uh, heavily relies on seafarers. So frequently um, when I'm talking to uh, people in the shipping industry, they refer to uh, the crew members as being the main assets uh, of a company. Uh, and um, I also, I think I have the impression uh, while talking uh, to the people that it's it's getting harder and harder to find and recruit uh, crew members and also officers. So then one will expect that um, they should provide also more incentives and better services for these people uh, while they are on board. And uh, again, it's my understanding that the reality is um, it's quite, uh, quite different. Uh, so the seafarers are often exposed for long period of time in severe conditions and without getting this proper health care support that they uh, they need. So what will be the result of that is that uh, many conditions may develop and may deteriorate and uh, they will go unnoticed uh, until they become uh, too serious and um, they will grow into uh, a severe uh, medical uh, incident. Um, and we are talking about uh, maybe cardiovascular diseases or some slight, uh, uh, let's say, early stage of diabetes or chronic pains, uh, fatigue, 
and uh, other chronic diseases uh, like that. And the impact is that, uh, yes, the, the conditions may deteriorate gradually without going uh, noticed until it becomes uh, a serious uh, medical uh, incident. And uh, there's also uh, other implications like financial implications for the shipping companies, like some statistics um, from the literature, we see that um, every fifth cargo uh, vessel uh, that needs to divert, uh, it does so with an average cost of $180,000. Uh, and um, there may also be environmental impact of that, that uh, due to the increased uh, CO2 emissions, if the vessel needs to divert or if there should be a helicopter evacuation. So um, we see here an obvious uh, need, which is multidimensional. At the societal level, it's the uh, need of the seafarers to, re to receive better healthcare uh, support. We have the financial need, as we mentioned earlier, and also the environmental one. And um, it's really striking uh, when you see that 20% of those medical cases that will cause a vessel to divert uh, are actually classified as non-critical and could have been avoided if there was proper uh, monitoring uh, in place. And um, at the same time, digital health on the shipping in, in the shipping industry, which is uh, catching up actually, um, again, uh, reports there uh, indicate that um, if you have some sort of telemedicine system uh, in place, then uh, that can save you 20% of the actual uh, total uh, costs going into handling medical incidents. And that's, um, it's estimated to be around 150 million per year. So we are talking about a big, uh, a big number here. So in the next um, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, we will discuss about um, what we mean about digital health and digital tools. And uh, we'll classify them, uh, we describe them based on three use cases that we identified. So when we talk about digital health, <coughs> it's not something, um, let's say, uh, it's not rocket science, or it's not something that probably you have not already, people are not already used to. It can be wearable devices that, and I'm sure that um, uh, many people also within the audience are using some sort of, uh, let's say, activity trackers or uh, smart watches that can measure some of the vital signs, let's say, the, um, your cardiac rate or, um, let's say, the sleep pattern or the stress level and uh, things like that. Uh, we talk about teleconsultation. So the, the option that when you need to seek for medical support, you can connect directly uh, with a healthcare professional and connect via video. Um, we talk about the electronic health record. So it's, it's, it's very important that the, um, uh, the medical record of the seafarers is available um, and um, can be presented when, when needed. For example, in the case of an unplanned care in a remote let's say, a uh, city around the globe, that, uh, that the EHR, as we call the electronic health record, is available and presented to the uh, health, the medical team there. Um, and of course, the remote monitoring, as we will describe later, which um, uh, sums up to the, again, uh, the ability of a medical team, which is back, um, let's say, uh, on the hospital side, or on the base of the seafarer is to be able to, to collect some uh, vital signs and um, have um, the overall uh, med uh, overall um, picture of the medical condition of the seafarers and intervene when it's necessary. Uh, and again, the idea here is that we don't try to handle if there is an injury or an accident on the ship, uh, then I think it's it's quite late and there are little things that uh, we can do or can be done. Rather, what we're trying to do is to act proactively. So we want to be able to, uh, to allow the seafarers to maintain a good physical uh, status so that we avoid such uh, medical incidents. Um, so I see some questions maybe coming in there. 
Uh, I think that Carl, it's better that we uh, we can finish with the presentation here, and then we can go in the QA se in the QA session. If you want to, that's from Chris Henney, who you just quoted in one of your slides. Too back, he's asking about should you have a remote diagnostics. But uh, yeah, we can do the questions at the end. That's fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh... Uh, yes, it's a correct, uh, it's, it's a right question. Um, so uh, the presentation today uh, here is focusing on the uh, digital tools that uh, can be available and can be provided to, uh, let's say, a shipping company or uh, on the boat, be available on the boat. Obviously, there are a lot of uh, also additional medical equipment and supplies that are necessary to be on the boat, like... Um, uh, drugs, medications, drugs, or rapid tests, as uh, it's mentioned here. Um, however, it's not in the scope, let's say, of this uh, uh, webinar session. We want to uh, to demonstrate the capabilities coming from the technological point of view. Um, so, um, Going forward into the uh, use cases that we can cover using uh, digital health solutions. First, we have the, the reporting and the handling of a medical uh, incident. Um, and we will go through later on in details uh, afterwards, but briefly we refer here, if something happens on board, what uh, how the captain or the officer on board can uh, report it in the, let's say, in the uh, care team or the medical team, which is um, uh, the shipping company maybe uh, collaborate with, and what sort of um, um, assistance they can, medical uh, assistance they can receive. The second use case refers to self-management and remote management of chronic diseases. And we discussed in the beginning that uh, there may be some uh, crew members, maybe uh, officers or captains that they are more senior also in terms of uh, age, that um, they may have some, let's say, slight uh, conditions, chronic conditions like um, an early stage of hypertension or diabetes, not very serious so that they can still, they are still allowed to get on, uh, on the ship, on the board. Um, but however, uh, they should be careful about that and they should have a, um, a way to control the condition and uh, self-manage it so that it doesn't deteriorate. And the third case, it uh, refers to having the medical record available in case of a planned or unplanned care when you are on the other side, let's say, of the globe and you need to be hospitalized. So, um, moving forward, Let's say that you have um, <laughs> there is a medical incident uh, on the board. Uh, again, while talking to a couple of uh, shipping companies in uh, in, in events, um, I think that the let's say the the, the practice today is that um, first most of the companies they don't seem to have an um, incident medical incident management um, solution in place. So some reported that. Um, when they need to seek for assistance, they can even uh, call, let's say, a doctor. Or some others, uh, they may write an email asking, reporting some symptoms and asking for assistance. Um, so we find that, um, we think that there's a more uh, effective and appropriate way that you can handle a medical incident so that first you get uh, immediate response when needed. And second, you, you uh, transfer all the required information needed also for the healthcare team, that is the, the symptoms, let's say, and afterwards having a way to monitor um, the condition of the seafarer so that you can uh, close the, uh, the incident or you can follow up with some additional, uh, let's say, interventions. So again, here we see using a solution how, uh, let's say, uh, either the captain or the healthcare team, they can create uh, an incident and there can be different uh, types uh, of the, the medical uh, category. And then, um, so 
the captain on 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 board they have their own uh, dashboard uh, available and they can create the ticket okay on the other side on the healthcare team side let's say the doctor uh, can immediately view uh, the profile of the seafarer so maybe some previous de uh, demographics that are available and some previous conditions or maybe some measurements if they have some sort of uh, IoT devices connected like blood pressure or some activity trackers. Uh, they can go into more detail uh, about the uh, past history of uh, medical incidents of that specific person or the general uh, the health record of the, uh, the, the specific seafarer. If needed, they can also have a, a video consultation because it's one way to uh, talk over the phone and explain what's the situation. And it's a whole different story from the doctor's side to have a visual uh, contact uh, with the person uh, so that they can better judge the, the condition. Um, and um, yes, then closing uh, this, uh, let's say this case, this use case, after the video consultation, uh, the doctors can, um, let's say, create, uh, let's say, sort of a care plan with some instructions of how this incident uh, should be handled. And there's always the possibility of asking a follow-up um, medical uh, assistance uh, via, again, a video uh, consultation. The second case uh, is the chronic disease uh, management. We discussed about uh, some crew members or maybe some officers that they have a slight uh, chronic disease at, at an early stage, like a hypertension. So in this case, normally these people should be careful about a number of things, like about the, uh, their diet, about um, their physical exercise, or uh, measuring some vital signs uh, frequently, like uh, the blood pressure or the glucose uh, level, and um, um, taking their medications uh, regularly. And then going beyond that, uh, there are some <clears throat> also more options and capabilities if we talk about, uh, again, having a healthcare team uh, being able to remotely uh, monitor the condition of that uh, person and um, intervene when uh, possible. So they can have um, they can receive some frequent feedback about the condition of the of the person via uh, questionnaires. So like, uh, how do you feel today? Or if you have some um, some if your symptoms are deteriorating or if um, they want to report some other uh, issue uh, related to their condition. Um, there's always, again, as we mentioned, the option of the teleconsultation and the remote health monitoring, which goes uh, on the line of um, the healthcare team being able to monitor the vital signs, evaluate rather the vital signs and uh, being able to intervene when uh, necessary. So all these things um, uh, take place in the form of a care plan. Um, so uh, the doctors uh, can create a, a care plan for a personal care plan for that specific person that can include uh, some medications to be taken frequently, uh, some exercise. Well, obviously it's restricted the, uh, the yes, the variety, let's say of the, the types of the physical exercise that one can do on the ship. Um, you can measure some uh, vital signs using some uh, medical devices um, and control your diet. Again, given the restrictions in the available, let's say, uh, meals that can be uh, on board. So all these things are created in the form of a care plan and uh, they are using the mobile phone and the application there, uh, the crew members can follow it on a daily basis. So they can have a, a to do a daily to do list with things that they need to follow and instructions that need to follow uh, every day. 
And um, here you can also see the, um, uh, the vital signs, the measurements, and they can be displayed in the form of a, of a chart. And this information <clears throat> is available both on the doctor uh, side, on the patient side, but also on the doctor side. So this is again, let's say the dashboard that the, the healthcare professionals can, uh, can look at. And that gives them the, the option, the possibility to create the care plans that we uh, just described with um, certain activities like medication, questionnaires, uh, taking some measurements. Uh, education is, is quite important also. And education can be, uh, let's say, instructions uh, about how they can handle their condition and how they can self-manage uh, their condition. Uh, also, things that they should be aware of while they are uh, on board. And uh, we also discussed about the option to describe and create a, a balanced diet. Again, given the, let's say the available options uh, on board. So it can go into, uh, down into the detailed nutrition plan described uh, per meal, like breakfast, lunch, dinner, or it can be more generic like things that um, they should consume or things that they need to, to avoid. Uh, some, let's say, um, some more advanced features also going into the um, uh, research and uh, development activities is uh, we can utilize uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning so that uh, by taking photos, let's say the crew member can take photos of the foods they consume and then immediately uh, the solution of the platform can identify, uh, let's say, the meal and produce the, uh, the nutrition facts of that meal. And um, yes, also one of the important uh, parts of the care plan is uh, that the uh, crew members can have available a number of IoT devices so that they can measure frequently the vital signs. And again, that depends on them. It, it can be personalized and depending on the chronic condition. And uh, all this information is available both to the uh, crew members via the mobile uh, solution and to the healthcare professionals, uh, as we uh, saw earlier, and you see here, via their own uh, specific dashboard. So by having this, um, uh, this piece of information, then again, proactively, if there are some, uh, let's say, alarming uh, measurements. Uh, they can the healthcare professionals can in the, the healthcare team can intervene and suggest some um, uh, yeah some um, some interventions like uh, change your your diet or maybe some changes in the medication and um, yeah. And um, quite interesting is also the option to have uh, alert rules, which means that uh, rather than having a healthcare team always uh, monitor and uh, being aware um, of uh, yeah, all these signals that are coming through, uh, you can set rules like uh, when, let's say, the, um, some specific uh, measurements exceed some certain thresholds, like the blood pressure is over uh, let's say 160, uh, then some uh, notifications or alerts are triggered. And that can, again, it's configurable. It can go both in the, uh, on the crew uh, member, on the seafarer, to the seafarer, or also to the uh, healthcare team. And we discussed about the option to provide some educational material. Uh, it can be more gener uh, generic and applicable to all the seafarers uh, while they are uh, on board, or it can be personalized and down to uh, a specific seafarer having a specific, let's say, chronic condition that they need to, uh, to self-manage. And through the questionnaires, it's also a way for the healthcare team to have a, um, a contact, keep a contact with uh, the seafarers and receive frequent feedback which is useful to evaluate the conditions and intervene if necessary. 
I will not go into details about um, yes, yeah, some more advanced things that they are uh, coming up and involve artificial intelligence and machine learning, only to give you a hint that um, um, how far technology can go and can help uh, healthcare teams and uh, obviously the seafarers or the patients in general is that uh, using the digital biomarkers. And these biomarkers can be uh, vital signs like uh, blood pressure or uh, sleep patterns that can give you a hint about uh, a growing condition. So by analyzing, continuously analyzing these biomarkers and uh, trying to identify specific patterns, it should be possible to detect early on a critical event. And we have, we have particularly work with fatigue because fatigue is one of the main reasons that causes accidents on board. And uh, fatigue can be, um, can be a result of, um, of a bad quality of sleep uh, or um, having an increased uh, heart rate or uh, let's say a heart rate which is goes beyond some usual uh, patterns. So by analyzing, by uh, measuring these specific biomarkers and analyzing them, it should be possible to early on detect the levels or the increasing levels of fatigue of some specific, uh, let's say, crew fares. And then you can say that, okay, this person may need some more uh, rest. Otherwise, there may be an increasing risk of uh, having an accident or an injury. And the third uh, use case, it's um, as we discussed, uh, the, the capability, the capacity of having the medical history available on the mobile phone of the crew uh, members uh, when needed in a planned or unplanned care. And that can be particularly uh, useful in the case of you have, for example, a, a person needs to be hospitalized and it may also be unconscious. And then the, the doctors there, they need to perform a surgery or provide some, uh, adhere some medications. Then it's, it's very important that they have the, the medical history of that person so that they can see if they have some, if they have allergies, for example, or past conditions or other medications that they get, so that they can uh, accordingly they can provide the treatment. And um, there is also the possibility to book appointments uh, via the platform, but I don't think that this is can be applicable in the case of um, yeah while you are on board, as we discussed there. There is the option that you can directly uh, ask for medical assistance and you can have uh, the video uh, consultation option so that you can directly talk to, to a doctor. And um, yes, here we see again how you can, how uh, a person can have all the uh, medical record uh, collected on uh, and available uh, through the, the phone and the application. So, uh, and uh, summing up and just uh, mentioning some other uh, side capabilities, but equally important is that it's important that all the information that is exchanged in such uh, solutions, they are stored using certain internationally uh, acknowledged uh, standards so that they can be shared with uh, third systems like hospital information systems when, uh, when needed and when required. <clears throat> and obviously, um, privacy should be um, a priority. And um, this is why uh, most of these digital health solutions, uh, they have a consent mechanism in place. Uh, and that means that um, the person is should be, and in this case, is always in control about uh, who has access to their information and uh, they can even restrict uh, access to specific doctors for example in a specific subset of their medical record and they can always grant or revoke consent to uh, to their medical uh, record and uh, this brings uh, me to the end of this uh, presentation so i just want to recap 
and um, yeah, uh, say once again that um, I think the time comes, at least from the technological point of view, that um, solutions, digital health solutions, are available, uh, and they are used in the um, let's say uh, apart from the shipping industry, these are already used in the context of um, a hospital and normal uh, patients. At the, at the same time, uh, as I understand also, the, um, there is the internet connectivity. Uh, now it's it's, um, it, it's getting better and better on the board and there is more and more bandwidth as well. So it can support such uh, solutions. And it's imperative that uh, shipping companies uh, start deploying uh, and offering uh, such solutions so that they can increase the level of the healthcare services provided to the seafarers, one of the main assets of uh, of them. And um, yes, uh, that will that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you very much for your uh, attendance. Whoa. And uh, I'm happy to yes uh, discuss any questions. No, well, thank you very much. So we'll go to the Q and A start part of the uh, session. If you want to stop slide sharing, so um. I mean, one thing that strikes me, um, so uh, just the health services in London, there's two different tracks. That's just because what I know, you've got the accident and emergency when you have something totally wrong. And then we have a we call it general practitioner, that somebody who looks after you if you've got or sees you regularly or sees you every six months if you've got an ongoing problem. And in shipping, we've only ever had the accident and emergency version. The, 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 we heard about the when, you, when something goes seriously wrong, we've never had the equivalent of the I don't know, we call it general practitioner in the UK, but this is kind of what you presented here. So I guess seafarers have never had this, never had somebody to keep an eye on them every few months, just as mm -hmm. everybody, everybody has a 50, 60 year old in, in most cities, I imagine. But I think that's yeah. the most interesting thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, I mean, you can imagine that, um, uh, I mean, before you have a heart attack, for example, and I'm, I'm mentioning now some serious medical uh, conditions with, while you're on board, if you have a heart attack, there are little things that you can do. Okay, it, it, you rely on maybe some the captain or the first officer that may have some previous training and whatever medical equipments are available there. Uh, but what you can do and what uh, you would like to do is to avoid such things. Okay, and you can do it if, as you mentioned, if you have some sort of monitoring and uh, yeah, someone keeping an eye on you and giving you some recommendations and suggestions early on. So, yeah, right. This is what we are trying to do also here. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the recommendations, I suppose, they're very general, like they're saying stop drinking, look after your weight, have exercise. But I suppose that's exactly how it works in normal health services. When you start getting certain problems, your doctor will say, look, you're a bit overweight. You need to uh, go for a walk yeah. every day. And uh, so I guess it's exactly yeah. the same as what works in, uh, in in the rest of the world, isn't it? I guess giving it, bringing it to seafarers and that. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, right. Mm -hmm. oh, fantastic. Well, we've got um, questions from two two different people. As, uh, so yeah. uh, Chris Henney, you, you actually quoted in one of your slides. Uh, I met Chris a long time ago. I didn't know he was into medical, but uh, obviously he is. And, uh, and Martin Nielsen is from a, uh, a a medical technology company in Singapore. But um, yeah, so so so, so Chris Henney, so we, we said the first two questions are a bit out of the scope. So we're, we're mapping out the technology how we're going to build technology which can do specific things, which is uh, support people's ongoing problems and uh, manage their data. I guess uh, so that's, that's the point with the, the rapid test. So uh, he's also asking about um, the uh, medical test contents. I suppose that's also a bit out of, well, I mean, that's a sort of a, we can't really solve that with digital technology, I suppose. That's a, uh, um, Martin is, yeah. is, I guess, he's a medical health expert, so he's picked the, picked the, the picked out the problems. All this, so I guess, he knows them very well. But his uh, questions about the the health records. So, mm -hmm. I've seen right. that you, you have this e health management thing, which you've developed yeah. for Greek um, clinics, and perhaps we're talking about Greek crew some of the time. If you've got Greek customers, although obviously Greek shipping companies don't always have Greek crew. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to? Talk a bit yes. About that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So yes. How do you get the historic health records for the crew? Right. So that's a very interesting uh, and crucial, actually, question and features that should be supported. Um, so there are, uh, in reality, there are a number of ways that you can do it, and it all depends on the, uh, let's say, the context and the available uh, options you have. 
So one option is that um, the crew themselves, they can upload their, uh, history, their uh, health record. Because we, what we referred here to is a personal health record. So there is a, an option by the solution to manually upload your past conditions, your, um, uh, let's say, allergies, or also upload documents and files like uh, lab results uh, and so on. Um, but in some cases, it may be required that uh, this uh, data information come directly from, let's say, the associated hospital or clinic. And this is where the, also the interoperability aspect comes into play, what I mentioned uh, towards the end of my presentation. So in some cases, and uh, as I just said, there are some civil companies that they are collaborating with some specific clinics and they send there the crew to do their medical uh, assessment. So in that case, yes, uh, the lab results, they may come directly from the clinic and they may be uploaded directly on the platform. And that's, uh, that's maybe a fourth use case that we didn't touch it, is the medical, the pre-medical assessment and evaluation of the crew before they get on board. So again, I said that in some case, in, I don't know if it's in some or in most of the cases, um, the crew member, they perform the medical uh, exams and then they take the results and they carry them, I mean, print it, they take them to the company. So um, this whole thing can be replaced and instead the hospital can directly uh, upload the results on the platform, the solution, and then it can be available also to the uh, shipping company or the doctors of the shipping company. So yes, and if we can, if we want to go also a bit beyond that, uh, at the national level, uh, countries are some of them they have already built. Others, it's in the roadmap that they build what they what is called the uh, national uh, health record. So they collect information, health information from their citizens from all, let's say, their encounters and their visits to either it can be a private uh, GP or hospital or clinic. And in some cases, uh, again, if the patient if, or the citizen provides consent, then the solutions like the one we described, they can connect to this national infrastructure and retrieve the, uh, the historical the health record. So yes, I think we mentioned three ways that the uh, data can uh, can come into the solution. One is manually by uh, the person itself. Second is used through the uh, hospital or the clinic, the associated one. Or third, at the national level, depending on the yes uh, the availability and the support. Yeah, I, I guess digital language translation is making a lot of the language issues a lot easier now than it was a couple of years ago. I guess if you've got a Greek clinic, they're not going to be able to speak English, are they, I imagine, or might not. E, e, yes, right. So that uh, that that brings another uh, interesting uh, topic that I would like to mention, uh, at least for the, the people who reside in EU, okay, at, at present. Um, now there is this uh, network, European network, health network, okay, and they are building this, uh, what's called cross-border healthcare infrastructure. What does it mean? Is that... Um, countries interconnect each other and are able to exchange healthcare documents of the citizens. And obviously these are translated. And uh, currently the documents supported are um, the patient summary, okay, and e-prescriptions. And that means that, uh, and that holds for, for citizens, like not only for seafarers, but for citizens. So if you reside, for example, uh, let's say in Portugal, and uh, you want to travel to Ireland or um, Germany or Netherlands, then uh, you should be able, you will be able to go to the pharmacy there and the pharmacist can retrieve your prescription from Portugal and they can dispense the medication. And likewise, likewise, if you need to be hospitalized, the doctor in that country that you are visiting can retrieve the patient summary. And these documents are translated in the country that you are visiting. So it will be in that case, it will be in Dutch, although you are a Portuguese citizen. So I hope that at some point that can be, uh, that can expand and go beyond also uh, Europe to cover more countries and more uh, languages. Wow, well, that's great. Um, yeah, it's a lady called Joanna Hero, who's a uh, 
newest lecturer in Finland has just put a post saying there's a digital guidebook in English for seafarers from a uh, Saka Kunta University of Applied Sciences. There's a there's a link on there if you want to copy that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but, uh, um, so so good question from, from both uh, Martin and uh, Chris on the confidentiality issue. I mean, you, you mentioned consent, but I suppose uh, so Martin's saying, can the employer get data about their people they're employing and uh, Christopher's asking about what well, there's emergency I think he's asking um I mean it's obviously much much harder than just say yes I consent I don't consent isn't it I suppose it gets very complicated this question doesn't it yes right so again um we are trying to bring um let's say to develop features and bring options that technology can provide okay and then obviously uh, there are certain policies and regulations that uh, mandate how all this technology can be used. So um, again, uh, in the presentation, we saw that um, uh, there is a, a consent mechanism. Okay, and again, this is it's not coming from let's say from our company. It's a um, it's a standardized way that is uh, put forward by international organizations in healthcare that uh, recommend and mandate how this um, health data are stored and how they are exchanged and who has control over that. And we are simply applying and uh, conforming to these regulations. So uh, there is available the consent uh, mechanism, okay, that um, as described, it uh, uh, brings, it's, it's the actual person that is in full control of who is accessing the data. And uh, they can provide consent to specific persons. They can revoke it at any time. They can even restrict to what's uh, to a subset of medical record that they need to have uh, access to. So uh, to be honest, yes, in some shipping companies or in some countries, and that mainly applies in, again in EU where we have the GDPR regulation. Maybe in some countries in Asia, it's not very, very strict. And uh, there again, maybe the shipping company uh, requests uh, immediate access to them, or maybe they only need to have access to the lab to the uh, lab results as part of the uh, pre uh, assessment uh, evaluation, medical evaluation. So in that case, again, obviously, it can the solution can be configured to uh, to whatever applicable policy or regulation is in place. Yeah, but I understand. It, yes, it's a very sensitive uh, matter, yeah. privacy. And uh, I think this is also one of the factors why the um, digital transformation in healthcare is kind of lagging compared to other sectors. Because yes, uh, privacy there and data sensitivity is uh, the most important aspect. But again, mm -hmm. there are regulations, European and national ones that protect this, um, uh, yeah, protect the data and the persons and the individuals. Yeah, but as a direct question, does a shipping company have access to the crew members' data if they have an incident and they need it in an emergency? I guess it all depends. You can't yes. say yes, they yeah. do, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, again, there is, um, it's called break the glass mechanism. Again, it's, it's described in international standards and how you uh, share or you may, be, you may bypass this consent mechanism. So it's called break the glass mechanism and it applies only in cases that, um, in emergency cases where the person is unconscious, for example, and obviously doctors need access to the medical record. Then yes, there may be, again, it's configurable, but you can have this, uh, you can activate this break the glass mechanism, and then it's mainly health care teams that gain access to that. And um, all this uh, access are uh, audited, are stored and audited, so that at a later stage, both the, uh, the the persons can audit who ha who had access to their data. So even if someone, let's say, activates or tries to activate the break the glass mechanism, that will be recorded. And if there is no, uh, if it cannot be justified, then yes, there will be a problem. So yes, we have this auditing mechanism so that we avoid unnecessary, uh, let's say, activation of these uh, mechanisms. Yeah, I love the way you're answering these questions. I can see you're a computer scientist, which you can see you can map these things out. And as long as we have a map, we can find the answer. So it's not going to be simple, yeah. but there's going to be a answer how to, uh, <laughs> we can find a way to get consent. And, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are engineers also, and engineers trying to find solutions and, uh, yeah, answers to 
real real problems. <laughs> yeah. But Martin uh, but also, oh. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I just want to say that uh, again to highlight that this is a very uh, important and crucial aspect data sensitivity, privacy, and uh, this break the glass mechanism. So there's a lot of work that has been done there at international level, and uh, international organizations are dealing with that. And um, yes, we, we have applied all these uh, mechanisms, and that's why we are, uh, yeah, I mean, we can discuss that and I can provide, I can provide this information. Yeah, very good. But Martin's also asking who are the uh, health professionals in your company? I mean, you didn't mention them, but I imagine you must have lots of doctors and uh, medical mm -hmm. people working in the company. Yeah, uh, actually not. <laughs> so oh, right. okay. we are, we are <laughs> yes, we are a technological company. So mm -hmm. again, we are providing, uh, let's say, the digital platform, the technological platform. However, we are collaborating with a number of um, uh, medical doctors in hospitals and uh, a number of uh, research uh, centers. And uh, we have collaborated um, with um, hospitals and universities all around Europe. In, um, I mean, I, I, I can mention in, in Spain, in Portugal, in France, in Turkey, in Greece. Um, and um, yes, the way we work is that um, we provide the technological tools and then there are healthcare teams coming from the hospitals, either private or state that providing the service. Okay, and and uh, also to mention that th this whole solution has been developed as a co-creation approach, meaning that we didn't create it from on top of our heads or of our heads, but rather consulting and working together with uh, healthcare teams. Oh, very good. So um, Martin's got another difficult question about, uh, well, we, what have you done in shipping? We, we said at the beginning that your background is mainly onshore and you're looking at shipping, but do you want to say anything about what you've done well, why have you shown interest in, in the shipping sector? Do you have any? Yes, right. So uh, again, uh, indeed, our uh, traditionally and uh, our main sector is on uh, hospitals and uh, patients, citizens, and providing these remote patient monitoring uh, solutions. And it has been um, the last, let's say, uh, one year that we are trying to expand and see the applicability of this um, uh, model in the in the shipping industry. So um, although um, uh, we don't have an actual let's say installation currently on ship on a ship, uh, we have talked with a number of uh, shipping companies that expressed their interest. We also collected feedback because obviously the the solution needs to adjust so that it accommodates to the peculiar peculiarities of the shipping world. So yes, we are uh, in discussion and there are certain companies interested in uh, applying uh, these uh, digital health uh, solutions. Oh, very good. So Martin's also and, asking oh, and, oh, and also uh, there are also healthcare providers that um, they are also interested in using the solution because uh, it can, um, so this solution on one hand, it, uh, it is used by the healthcare team so, and um, as I understand, there are shipping companies are collaborating with hospitals, providing services specifically for the shipping uh, companies in, in industries. So it can work for this uh, sector and also for the shipping industries and the seafarers that they, as we saw, they also have their own dashboard and solutions so that they can also monitor uh, their condition and receive the recommendations and uh, instructions of the care teams. Wow, very good. Yeah. So Martin's also asking about digital biomarkers. What are they gathering? Is that, is that biomarkers? Does that mean a sensor? So you monitor somebody's sleep or their heart rate? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what that's what I'm Yes, saying. right. Yes. So um, that can be um, vital signs that they are measured uh, using um, some simple uh, IoT devices. And that can can come as simple as uh, from an activity tracker, for example, that can measure your physical uh, exercise or your sleep pattern, and can be more uh, specialized uh, medical devices that can, that can um, measure uh, the blood pressure, uh, blood glucose level, uh, heart rate. I mean, it all depends on the specific condition that you want to, uh, to measure. And there is a lot of research uh, to, towards in this domain and, and with the development and involvement of the AI 
And um, there are positive results that show that indeed, uh, using machine learning and collecting these past measurements and trying to find specific patterns, it should be possible, or at least with some percentage, to predict some, let's say, more serious uh, medical incidents, like a heart attack. So by measuring previous um, um, values of specific measurements, uh, you may predict, again, with a certain, of course, confidence, not 100%, that uh, maybe a, a heart attack may may happen, and this is what we yeah refer here by collecting uh, gathering digital biomarkers, and try to predict some more serious uh, medical incidents. Wow, oh, very good. There's a question at the bottom of the board from Alejandra who says he's in La Guajira, which I had to Google is in uh, Colombia, but he's asking about the the timeliness. So is it? Oh, you, we're not monitoring people continuously and sending the data continuously, are we? Or we'll yeah. sort of crew members saying, I've got a problem and somebody can say, let me see your data. Is that like a like in a clinic? Is that So so the solution, uh, it's obviously 24-7. I mean, the platform can collect real time the information and yeah, share them with the healthcare uh, team. Of course, uh, it um, uh, it requires internet connectivity. Okay, uh, in case that um, and I I understand that there may be some regions or some parts of the whole journey of the ship that there is no internet connectivity. In that case, the values, the measurements, and all information recorded by the seafarers, for example, are stored within the mobile uh, application, and they can be transmitted soon as uh, internet connection is restored. So in this case, uh, yes, provided that we have internet connectivity, um, the solution works real time and all information is exchanged real time. Now, um, obviously the healthcare team may not be available 24 seven, or again, that depends on the, maybe on the provisions of the uh, shipping company. Mm. Uh, however, in that case, and that's why we mentioned that the platform provides this uh, alert rules uh, mechanism, which means that, and, and and to be honest, it, it, the healthcare team should not be and doesn't need to be 24-7 available. However, the condition and the values uh, can be monitored by the platform 24-7 and they can be evaluated and assessed. And if uh, a critical event is triggered or is uh, detected, then it can trigger some um, notifications to the healthcare team or to the uh, CFR itself. Like you mentioned, like we mentioned before, such an alert rule can be if the measurements of the blood pressure the last the last uh, week or the last three days the average uh, value it's beyond the certain certain threshold and there is the condition of a uh, hypertension or um, cardiovascular let's say heart related diseases for that person then an event can be triggered because the blood the blood pressure is high consistently for three days at a row. And then they may be the, you know, the, the healthcare team may be notified and provide some recommendations. This doesn't happen on land very much. If somebody has diabetes, they're not monitoring their data and sending it by cellular phone the whole time. I don't think unless it's very serious. Or... Yeah, um, yeah, so uh, such uh, services, they are also catching up with, uh, yeah, on land and with okay. uh, chronic disease persons. And um, it can also work with people that are in remote locations. So think about people in some remote villages or some remote islands that they cannot frequently visit a hospital. And they don't need to actually because um, some visits to the hospital are ne un unnecessary. Okay, and they can be uh, avoided if there is such a system in place of uh, remote monitoring. Oh, well, we've got three questions from Chris. Maybe we'll take them all. Well, he's saying mainly one uh, is any differentiation between men and women in what you're doing? How big is the file size? And are you willing to share your email address? Can we take all of those at once? Yeah, uh, obviously, I can share my email address. Okay. Yeah, let's start with the easy uh, <laughs> answers. <laughs> um, how big is the file size of a health record of a seafarer? Um, yeah, so that um, depends on the amount of information, meaning that um, most of the data can be stored as a, in a database, so not as a file, not as a document. 
and then that can be that can be quite small if it's just records in a database. Um, I cannot provide an accurate, I mean, an exact uh, number, but it can go uh, with in, in the range of a couple of kilobytes up to a few megabytes. Um, the health record may become uh, bigger if we need to store also documents in the form of PDF or uh, images, JPG file. And uh, yes, then we can estimate, let's say, um, let's say one or two megabytes per uh, per file. So it all depends on how much information we we want to to store there. But in in most of the cases, what we also do is that we convert the documents into uh, structured data and we store them in databases. So that in this case, we can also uh, reduce the number of. Um, the, the 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 size of the file the size of the whole health record it only in some cases and for provenance reasons that it may be required that we also store the original clinical document so, but again it all depends on the uh, policies and regulations and the context um and okay. if we differentiate yeah between men and women um we don't really differentiate. Um, however, as we mentioned, uh, the, the care plans that the healthcare teams can create are personalized, meaning that it, they take into account the specific person. And in this context, they may also take into account if they are male or female. For example, this, I don't know, um, because also I'm not a medical doctor, uh, but I may assume that uh, it may uh, matter, for example, I don't know, maybe it may, it may, some vital signs. Maybe men and women have different, uh, I don't know, thresholds, or they may have. And then, the, yeah, that, that can be taken into account when creating a care plan. Oh, very good. So uh, last yeah. question for Martin. We've got about two minutes left. He's asking about companies' environmental and social and governance strategy. I guess it's kind of self-explanatory that if shipping companies are offering such services to their crew there that's a part of their social, mm -hmm. social exactly service. yeah exactly yeah, yes it can yes right and uh, we also think that they can, it can contribute also in the environmental impact so if you can manage and uh evidently such solutions uh can lead to uh, reducing the number of uh, diversions of a ship or uh reducing the helicopter the air evacuations that may be required so if you manage also to uh yeah contribute into that reduce the number of uh, diversions then obviously this um uh brings down the uh co2 em emissions and it may also have a green uh, impact yeah, you said 20 percent reduction in diversions but i guess nobody really knows for sure how many diversions you're saving with this it could be a lot more isn't it yeah Yes, definitely. So I, I got all these uh, facts from uh, from literature and from uh, yes, uh, uh, I mean from uh, uh, research uh, papers and uh, validated sources from uh, from the literature. Wow, fantastic! Well, that's fantastic. I think that's the end of the webinar. When the time is finished, I think you've done a great at mapping out where these things are going and how they've got to go and. Uh... That's a map everybody can use, no matter what technology they're using. I think so. That's very helpful. And uh, thanks for thinking all this through so carefully. And uh, thanks also to the questions from uh, Martin, Chris, and Alejandra. So I shall pass back to Farah for the closing words. Cheers. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you also very much yeah. for the opportunity to yeah have the discussion today. Thank you to our guest speaker, Dr. Fotis Gonidis from. Gnome on Informatics and to all our viewers. We'll be sending you a YouTube video link soon with contact details if you have any further questions. Join us for our next webinar on the 18th of April with GTT, which you can book online at our website. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.